I'm waiting. Oh, you don't have a wooden spoon, Emakai. I understand. If you have a wooden spoon, what do you use it for? Stir and mix ingredients, Mamzotwa. Yes, to stir when cooking, it works the best. Oh, power. To spank the kids, Pulen, I love it. You can use it to spank kids and it works. What else? Stirring and mixing, Mpumi, yeah. You can throw it at your kids. I saw in other houses, they use it as a decoration and we use it for many things. But if I may ask, I don't know if you know this. Do you know that you can use the very same wooden spoon for those that are vegan, whenever you are cooking your soup, your, your, your lentils or your beans, normally when you cook, when you boil it, the water and the foam will be boiling over the pot. Do you know that when you put that wooden spoon across the, the pot, the, the foam or the water won't be spilling out the, the pot? Did you know that you can use that for that reason? Not to only spam kids. So you can own a wooden spoon for 20 years without using it correctly for that matter. Yes, I use that for pasta. Yes, so that's the reason. So there are certain things that we have and, 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 and we use it uh, for a very long time, but we are not using it fully uh, correctly for that matter. So you need to use your hands to benefit you. I also, okay, let me not, uh, because I have so many questions. The second question is this, you spoke up, oh, let me just another thing that, for another thing that you can do without these things, what you can do is you can, you can, you can walk around the house backwards. I know it's dangerous, don't be in it, don't rush, but just walk slowly backwards. So it also allows your brain to concentrate on what you are doing. And then it trains certain parts of your brain to concentrate and it heightens or it makes your brain better. Another thing that you can do is you can buy different spices, healthy ones, of course, your herbs, your rosemaries, your basil and all those things. And close your eyes, close your eyes and try to smell and, and, and say this is what and see the different smells and say this smell is of this, it also helps your brain to, to also improve. You can also do that if you don't wanna do this thing. Another question was, you spoke about dreaming and our solutions coming from our dreams. Please elaborate more on this. I don't know why I spoke about dreams, but this is my response. It's important to remember your dreams. The reason is, um, there are certain things that we are battling with in our lives, whether it's your spouse or whether you should change your job or not. It's important that you have solutions to those problems. Did you know that there are dreams that you shouldn't ignore in your life? Um, especially dreams that are recurring. When your dream is coming to you over and over and over, you should not ignore those dreams. There are dreams that we all have the dream where you are falling. Have you ever had that dream where you are falling? How many of you have that dream? You are dreaming, you are sleeping, but you are dreaming as if you are falling. There's another dream where you feel like you are being chased. Do you know those dreams where someone is chasing you in the dream? Do not ignore those dreams. There are dreams where you feel like you are drowning. There are dreams where you feel like you are arrested and you can't move. There are dreams especially this dream, I used to have this one, a dream where you feel like you are losing your teeth. Do you have those dreams? Um, and they have their meaning. Now of lately, they, I have another dream that is strange. A dream where I dream I'm naked in front of people. If you have those dreams, do not ignore them. The reason for that is your subconscious mind is trying to tell you something about yourself. You might not know yourself, but somehow God speaks through your subconscious to tell you what's happening with your body. For instance, Abanyebet, we would have pimples, Epswain, and you would try to drink this and that and that. Sometimes it's just your subconscious mind telling you something is happening inside your body. So dreams should not be ignored, especially the dreams. There are a lot, if you can Google them, because I don't have time to address them. And there are meanings, I can tell you the meanings of, 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 of all those dreams, but I don't have time for that. 
uh, for instance, the one in Ketuhi Kuruma, uh, where you, you dream as if you are naked. It's for people that have, uh, they, they have validation issues. When you see people, you always want to please people. So your brain is saying that you need to be more assertive. There's no need for you, even now, le, le lose a when you are losing your teeth in your dreams. Your board, your subconscious mind is telling you that you are, you are supposed to be more assertive. Instead of pleasing people, you need to please yourself. Another dream that you should not um, uh, uh, ignore, the one where you feel like you are arrested or you can't move. Your subconscious mind is saying that you are stuck maybe in a relationship. I'm not a dream aspect. It's, this is just common knowledge. It's like you are feeling you are stuck in a relationship or in a friendship or in a job. Okay, there's another one uh, where I learned to fly in my dream. That one also, please do not ignore that one. That one, it can mean two things. One is that you can move, you are ready to move to the next level with your life. Or worse, the opposite of that is, it can mean that uh, you are trying to run away from something in your life and something is just hindering you from doing that. So your subconscious mind is talking to you regarding that. I'm not a dream expert, but this is just common knowledge that you can find. Hopefully if we have time and you have more questions, we can address that in the afternoon. I just wanna rush through to other questions that I have. It says, is AS3 question, I think they are linked or related to each other. It says, okay, before Nyagut, what other dreams do you normally have? The recurring dreams that you have? And did you know something? Let me just throw in something. Do you know that your brain or your, your subconscious mind cannot distinguish between what is happening in real life and something that is vividly imagined? It cannot tell if it's real or not, especially for uh, your, your subconscious mind. This is what I mean. Have you had a dream where you are dreaming picking up Imali? And you feel so excited and it feels like you are actually picking up Imali. Or another dream where you are waiting in Google. You know, the reason why Batama it's because in their heads, it looks like it's happening. There was a study that was done. Um, they took two people that love dogs. One, they showed him the dog and he was touching it, uh, caressing the, the dog because white, white people love dogs. And then the other person was put in the other room and was told that he needs to imagine caressing and loving a dog. When they were analyzing their brains, they discovered the same effects on both people were happening. So sometimes when you vividly imagine something, your brain will interpret that thing as if it's happening in real life. So this is the question, what is the effects of sleeping early on our brains and what is the recommended times to sleep? Okay, the first part, the effects of sleeping early. I strongly recommend that you sleep early. So when you sleep early, there is what we call uh, sleep cycles. And a cycle, each cycle, it's 90 minutes. That's when now you start to dream after 90 minutes called a saccat or a, a, a cycle. And in those cycles, you need four of them, four cycles of 90 minutes to, leap, to sleep proper. All those people that normally exceed to the other uh, 90 minutes or the fifth one or the sixth one, you normally wake up tired. When you're born or when you, you just woke up, but you already feel tired. It's because maybe you, you, were, you were supposed to wake up, but you, wake up, you woke up after some time. So the effects of sleeping early is you need to be well rested so that your brain can be cleansed from the plaque that I spoke about yesterday. So the effect of sleeping early is you'll be, you'll be processing information, you'll be consolidating the information correctly. Enough times, your brain need enough time to do that. So eight hours to nine hours, most people that sleep eight hours to nine hours, they normally remember their dreams because of the duration. But whenever you do not spend enough time sleeping, a lot of you will be suffering in your old age because of the things that you are doing. Another doctor was saying life begins at 40. 
After 40, that's when you see the consequences of how you were living your life. Now your body is paying it revenge on you. Utenu Gooks, perhaps in the dreams part, it may be necessary to interpret dreams under the light of the spirit in instruments, okay? Dreams are part of the functions of the outpouring. I love that, my leader. I love that. I love that. I love that. Exclusive Freudian interpretations of dreams in the internet, just precautionary word. Okay, no, I get what you are saying, my leader. But I was just, just highlighting that. But I thank that part, my leader. It's noted. Thank you. And then the question continues to say, sleeping early. And then it says, oh, another thing that I do. In fact, when the sun sets, we should be also going towards sleeping. So the thing that I want you to do is, if you can sleep, I read somewhere that if you can sleep two hours before 12 o'clock, you are well rested. Two hours or three hours before 12 o'clock. A lot of us cannot sleep before then because of the habits that we have formulated. Another thing that I want to give you caution on is stay away from your computer two hours or three hours. Stay away from your computer and your, your screens because it emits a blue light, which is terrible for your, for your, for your, for your, melat for your melatonin, a hormone responsible for sleeping and rest. So it, it interprets that as if it's daylight. That's why you battle to find. Normally you would see them on Facebook, they would be posting, is anyone awake? The reason you are not sleeping, it's because you are in front of your cell phone. It's not good for your sleeping hormone. And then uh, there's a lady here that says, my memory started to be bad after chemotherapy. Can that be a contributing factor to my memory loss? What can I do to remedy the situation? Uh, effects of medication, radiation, toxins on our brains. Yes, ma'am. I saw your question that day when you were asking it. Indeed, e chemo is like poison. So anything that is, is poisonous, it's terrible to your brain. It kills your brain cells. It's not good for you. So the reason why you are forgetful is because of that thing. I strongly recommend, ma'am, that you speak to Usheron so that she can assist you with cleaning the blood. You would notice something when your blood is clean, also it helps with your brain. You cleaner the blood, the clearer your thinking and your brain functions and abilities would be. So just speak to Sister Sharon, the one that we had on Saturday, or you can talk to me. I can suggest a few things that can assist you, but Usheron will be the proper person to clean the blood and to advise you going forward. You need to clean your system. And then the other question is a bit long, but I will try to summarize it. The first one is based on Romans 7 verse 15. And then it continues to say, I think we all know the verse, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Now within the context of this verse, we acknowledge that our flesh is weak, though the spirit is willing, how then do I reconcile my willingness to do good, which I would presume dwells in my frontal lobe with my action? Okay. How do I daily subdue my will to the good I want to do? That is not easily translated into action. So basically what you are saying, oh, it's, it, it continues. Okay, we know the, 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 the dilemma of uh, Romans 7, verse 15. The good I want to do, I do not do. And the bad that I don't want to do, that I do. So how do I reconcile my will and the action? My answer to you is, you need to be totally dependent on God, especially when it comes to such a matter as spiritual matters. A lot of us, we wanna do good things but we cannot because our nature does not allow this. Can we do a quick exercise that will help me to analyze and give you this? Take both of your hands like this, clasp them together like this, or even above your head like this. And then with your right hand, 
try to push your left hand as much as you can. So I want you to use as much force as you can. So you are pushing your left hand with your right hand. So your right hand is the one that is doing the pushing. Are you ready? So I want you to do it and you tell me the effect. Try to push your left hand as much as you can. Go. Try to push it as much as you can. Are you doing it? Okay, fine. After doing that, can you please tell me what's your experience? What's happening? What are you noticing? What's happening with your hands? What's happening with your hands? So your right hand is pushing your left, right? So when we are pushing as hard as you can, what is happening? What have you noticed? Are you able to do it? It will perfectly answer. I'm feeling tired. Why? Resistance from the left hand. Zama, you are quite right. So this is my point. I only told you to push with your right hand and I didn't tell you what you must do with your left. I just told you to just push. So this is the, the thing that I want you to understand with your question, Sam. Whatever you're trying to resist, it will persist. So whenever you want to quit the alcohol, the more you try to resist, it persists. So whatever the habit that you might have, it's in our nature. Whenever I say, I don't wanna drink, you find yourself drinking. So this is a question of just totally depend and fully rely on God. And like I said earlier, any Indo, for instance, my problem was, was, was eating food, Gakul. And I learned from Sister White that intemperance, when you do something and you overdo it, it's not good for you. And the more I tried to resist that thing, I found myself telling myself, as in, I, this thing I conagal. And then someone advised me that you need to start fasting, my brother. It's not easy, but you need to do it. I tried. You know what? When I decided that on Wednesday I'm fasting, guess what? On Wednesday, my friends will be coming carrying groceries. I'm a vegan. Let's eat, my friend. And I would find myself eating. Here's, the, here's my answer. For this one, especially for spiritual matters, you can do it. This is the attitude that you need to have, that you can do it. But you can only do it by God's grace. So when you make that decision, make that decision with a promise that you are doing it for God. So especially when your motive is to do it for something higher or better than you. For instance, the people that are drug addicts, if you want them to quit, you might take them to Inyawope, Inyawope centers and all those things. Sometimes it does not work. What seems to be working is you need to give them a reason better than themselves. Like if you have a child, do it for your child. There's an old man I know, Wase White City, Langthalakon. This old man had a Nyaupe son. And he was trying to advise the Nyaupe son, which, no, this thing, man, it's easy. It's just you. You know the saying that we normally say, the cliche, like, uh, it's all in the mind, son. Don't allow Nyaupe to take charge. It's all in the mind. The old man said that and said, Mena, I can take Nyaupe today and tomorrow I would quit. Guess what? He did that. He smoked in Yaope with the son today. Tomorrow, both of them were hooked. The mother went to HOZ FM to ask for help. So Mama Uti, now it was easy for me to guard in I am. You know, my son would come while I'm, while I'm cooking. When I go to the loo, he would steal the pot and run away to sell it or whatever he does. Now he's saying, I have two people in my house, my husband and my son hooked on this thing. The biggest mistake that the old man did was to go toe to toe with the devil. I don't want you to go toe to toe with the devil. Sister White says the only person that can have a contention or an argument with the devil is God. Do not make that mistake. So if you, the person of Buzelombuzo, you can never easily subdue that thing. The Bible says, he who has begun a good work in you will not end there. He will help you to finish or go through that. So God has already started his good work. For the mere fact that you have remorse and you want to change your conduct and act good, God is working in your heart. So work with him and cooperate with him. Inch by inch is a cinch. Hard, yard by yard is too hard. Easy 
take it easy, slowly, and go through towards the, 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 the end. And then the next part says what? Let me see the questions. Uh, okay, do you offer services pro, okay, there it's a, it's a latter one. There was another one that I, I want here that was given to me. It says, where do you draw the line between being realistic about your limitations and negativity? This one is powerful and a bit difficult as well. Where do you draw the line between being realistic about your limitations and negativity? Okay, so it depends on what you want to achieve. One, when you say that it is impossible, there's no need for you to even try because you have already made that decision. Uh, because it's the Sabbath, I cannot quote uh, secular people, but they would say things like, okay, let me not quote them. So this is how you do it. There's a guy by the name of uh, Roger Penister. Roger Penister, just Google him, Roger Penister. Roger Penister won a four minute mile. So Roger Penister was a runner. Roger Penister was, was, grew up in an era where they, they said a man cannot cross the finish line before four minutes. Roger Penister, they had an understanding that if you are a runner and you run faster than four miles, your heart will literally explode in your, in your body. They believed that literally, that if you can run faster than that, your heart will explode. All the athletes could not go through the, the, the finishing line within four, four minutes. Until Roger Penister decided to, you know what, I need to make a decision that instead of saying, I do not have that limit, I am limited to do it. I wanna do it. I wanna be the first one to cross the finish line within four minutes. What he did, he prepared his mind for that thing. So I want you to also be realistic in the fact that, what am I saying? Uh, uh, I, wanna, I want to be a millionaire, okay? You need to, to, to check that. Is it possible or not? What do I need to do for me to get to that level? So there is an imaginative thinking and there's a realistic thinking. I get what you are saying. But when you are being negative, you are not even going to try. I want you to change that mentality. Think about what you are saying. Is it reachable? What can I do? What your brain does, your subconscious mind, whenever you say something, your brain is also listening. When you are sleeping, it will try to figure out solutions. For instance, last year, yeah, last year during COVID, I wanted to do a course and I was unemployed and the course was about six or seven. They want 7,000 immediately before they can even take it. Then I'm unemployed and I cannot borrow money. If you know me, that's me. So it's, it, the, 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 the issue was bothering me for some time. I was praying about it. I was thinking about it. So because I was thinking about it so much and I even thought, because I'm a very optimistic person, I'm going to get this money, but I don't know where. But if I'm willing, I'm willing to work for it. Where can I go and work? So my brain is always thinking of solutions. When I was sleeping one day, I wake up. My brain says, you need to speak to a certain guy. I only saw his post on Facebook. He normally posts jokes and his life. And then my brain just told me, because I'm always thinking about this, speak to this guy. Because it has been bothering me and I know that this can be done. I just spoke to that guy, inboxed him, and we started chatting and I asked him for this money that I wanted. This man, the first question Nguzayona was, I've never spoken to you before. Why are you asking me? And it's not in my nature to ask money. I would rather die than ask someone money. But for some strange reason, I asked that guy and I had the confidence of asking so much money from a guy that I've never spoken to. That guy asked me that question and I tried that. I don't know why I asked you, but this morning I had a compulsion to call you and ask for money. And that guy within 30 minutes or so, he transferred the money. He spoke to his wife, of course, and then he transferred the money. Namanji, I only got in that money because I was always thinking about the problem. How do I solve this problem? How do I do something? So it's a pity I do not know, but I'm just hitting around your question. I don't know what you are battling with. If I knew exactly what you were referring to, I was gonna address that thing directly. 
So I'm just assuming it might be work related. It might be other things, I don't know. But I know my time is up for now. I think I've covered all my questions, at least in the afternoon, I'll be able to concentrate on my topic. Guys, I thank you. Mam Kok, over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mam Kwam. Uh, if you've missed any of, of, of our programs during the week, uh, they are live. I, I mean, they are on Facebook and they are on YouTube. So you can visit Owet's Facebook page or you can go even on YouTube. You will find all of them Perfect. there. Yeah. Uh, I will now give over to Mpati, yeah, Sabbath School, uh, Sister Connor. Can you please take over? We will see you again this afternoon as we are going to continue with the sessions with Wumkwum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Mamuko. Thank you so much, Mr. Kum, and to the Health and Temperance Department. That was, we had such a blessed week. As long as was in Amaka, especially if so, if you were listening um, to Uputsi was speaking to us, may God really bless you. Um, I don't have much to say. I was just doing thank yous. I'm sure um, it's party say divine service manje. I'm not sure. I didn't check with um, my elder if uh, he's available with any announcement. Sorry, I think I was, I got cut. Can I ask um, maybe Umdala if he has um, announcement? before we can ask him to Jerry to, 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 to give us a piece of, of music to take us to the divine service. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, we, yeah, we have uh, no announcements. Uh, you may proceed uh, with the program. Thank you.
Jumelang Habib Bazalan. Hello, Mom. Mrs. Kona, can you hear me? Yes. We are here. We are here, Tezri. Okay, okay. Mdala ukupa hore muruti are ridere some African songs. So uh, we will do number 302 in Sikosa. I bazalwana luri to sing but to Sikosa ne. We will we will just try to do these songs kaskos. <laughs>
Diko kele ki nambambang bazalwan. Diko kele uye ofa. Two one nine. Two one nine. at the Cox House family. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen, Sister Cox. Uh, as we are about to start now, uh, we'll thank you for the program from Health and Temperance Department. Can we open with a prayer so that Elder James can start? Uh, Elder Sbego, can you pray for us? Let's pray. Our sister Zulini, tell us numsa ba iskatin samanje si sonlabu. We stala pam we stala sako sobko si mumkulebu. Sbonga chowa ibu si sosi paso na ngasu zonke intu. Sbonga chowa isi posempilo. Sbonga isimfundi so isintos paso. Singen is cutting manje chova la poso to slay le corner is we elvela who win the viaco. She has Baba Wooty when also Columba in the viaco. Stella Bawi Nigese, Amaz Yasuti, Asake, as Condise, Ascensive and Abandon. Especially we pray for, for him as well, that you may bless him as he blesses us. This is our prayer in Christ Jesus, done forevermore. Amen. 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 Elder James. The floor is yours. Amen. Okay, we are just uh, tuning in right now. The music was absolutely wonderful. Can you hear me? Can you can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Elder James. We are audible. 
Okay. Uh, one last thing, Billy. Do you have a um, the code for your okay. Zoom? Give me your code, Billy. Eight nine. Did you put the pretty knife fire in there? Eight nine three. Eight, eight five, five two one nine nine four five. And then put the password. No caps. It doesn't have passcode there. Good for this thing. No okay, passcode. Yeah, yeah. Your passcode is health what? Put it on caps. H E A L T H at what? And P. Not at and. And yeah. And capital T. Okay. Now, can you see me, Billy? Can you see me, Billy? Okay, so that's good. Okay, so Tell me, hang it up. Hang you tell me, hang up the phone. Why can't you? Okay, let's go. Uh, the baby, can you see me? We can hear you, but there's a background. Leave one, one, one budget, budget there. Okay. How about now? You are audible now. Okay, and you can see me visibly, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. So I think we're using this camera right here. Okay. Okay, so we're talking about the mind for the last days. And uh, Kunjani, everyone unmute and say Kunjani back to me, please. Okay. I'm happy to be here with you today. I'm Dr. James. Of course, I'm a member of that church right there. I remember um, when we were there, and we had a wonderful week of prayer. And this is a befitting week of prayer, the week of prayer that talks about a beautiful mind for the last days. If Corona has not convinced you that we're in the last days, nothing will. You've seen bodies taken into morgues and taken into hospitals. If you've children burying the old and the old burying their children. You've, You've seen, seen also social upheaval. You've seen social upheaval, and you've seen a lot of conflict between cultures and races. You've seen governments that are being made into rubble, and people who have oppressed coming back looking like they want vengeance. Something is happening. Let's go to the beginning of the story and let's talk about the mind. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, unfortunately we have Genesis 7, verses 6 to 9. It should be Genesis 3, 6 to 9. It talks about when Noah was 600 years old and the flood covered the earth, he went on board of the boat to escape the flood. 
he and his wife and his sons and their wives. With them were all the various kinds of animals, those approved for eating and for sacrifice, and those that were not along, all along the birds and the small animals that scurried along the ground. They entered the boat in pairs, males and females, just as God had commanded Noah. That was the end of time for Noah. And I want you to know whenever there's an end of time, God always has a way of escape. I said, whenever there's an end of time, God always has a way of escape. Noah was 600 years old. It was the end of time. The antediluvians had begun to do sin. Many people began to mix genes. There are people who had just given up on God. And despite knowing everything that happened from Adam's time to Noah, people were still in rebellion. What was really wrong? Well, they had developed a bad mind. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that Adam, when he sinned, and we remember what happened in that Garden of Eden, he stood there and everything was bliss. It was a beautiful garden. It wasn't just beautiful because the woman was beautiful, but the mind was beautiful. They knew no sin. They knew no guilt. They knew no condemnation. They were reproducing righteousness. They had the mind of Christ. Christ dwelt in their mind, and they dwelt in Christ. And friends, I want you to know, when your mind is pure, and your body is pure, you become like God. Yes, restored into the very moral image of God. Friends, but I want you to know, after a period of time, People's minds got worse. Daniel chapter 2 helps us to understand that. This condemned mind that gets worse. It gets worse. Now, Daniel, remember, is now in, he's one of God's people. He is a person that's giving a picture about the future. And I want you to know Daniel's future was not just for Daniel. It was a future for you and me right there in South Africa, here in Bermuda, in 2021, dealing with the coronavirus. Daniel could see that it wasn't just the body that was corrupted by corona. It would be the mind that's going to be corrupted by coercion. The text says, during the third year of the King Jehoiakim, the reign of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory. I'll say it again. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim. King Jehoiakim was God's people. But sometimes God allows oppressive powers to have victory. But even when the oppressor is having victory, you've got to keep your mind. God never intended for the oppressor to take your mind. The text says, and of course, and he permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God, sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Now, there's always the issue of worship. They took some of the treasures. They took some of the belief systems. They took some of the, the spiritual systems. And I want you to know today, God always has a true system, and the devil has a counterfeit system. The devil always takes God's true system and tries to mix it with the counterfeit system. Nebuchadnezzar shows you the first signs of pagan amalgamation of the true worship system with the false worship system. I want you to know worship is about your mind. The text says, and then, and so then the king ordered Espinaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. What he did here is, not only did he take the worship system, he took the people. I want you to know, friends, that we are living at a time when there's an oppressive power that not only takes worship systems through Christianity, but also captures people. God's people who he wants to worship as true Christians. Stay with me. Remember that. 
Pagan systems usually mix truth with error, and it takes people and oppresses them by an oppressor. But the Bible says it was God that allowed it to happen. It says here, select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. He said, make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning and gifted with the knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the languages and literatures of Babylon. Friends, they wanted not just to take the worship system and corrupt it with paganism. They didn't really just want to take the people and oppress them. No. They wanted to turn the people into preachers and make them follow the pagan worship system. In other words, they want to control the mind. It says, the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Do you know today that the devil is still trying to take us by an oppressive system, give us an oppressive religion, make us oppress people so that we can begin to promote the devil's agenda. And it all happens with the mind. And the text says, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them. They want to change your name. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Mishael, Ezra was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined, the text says he purposed in his heart, the New Living Translation he says he made up his mind, the Amplified Version says he made sure in his mind, so you got to have a made up mind. The text says not to defile himself by eating of the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff to permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now, friends, you might think as a medical doctor, I'm coming to talk about the impact that food has on the mind. Well, we do know that flesh foods excite the base passions. In other words, foods like sugar, animal products, they not only increase inflammation, causing diabetes, causing heart disease, making it worse for you to have a, a, a successful sex life, or uh, affecting your kidneys, cause you to go to blind, get your feet chopped off. Yes, sugary products with flour and sugar and animal products, these things are not good for your body. We know that. But we also know that it excites the base passions. Now, as a medical doctor, we don't talk about base passions because the medical profession believes that there is a separation between the body and the spirit. As a matter of fact, because of atheism, evolution, and Darwinism, they don't even think the spirit is real. They think we are just biological products. So the focus is only on the body, not the spirit. But I want to tell you that the food you eat, even the scientists know, affects the mind. Sugary foods make you tired. Certain foods may turn into alcohol and make you susceptible to poor judgment. Certain foods do make you more aggressive. We've seen that. But from a spiritual perspective, certain foods cripple your ability to understand spiritual matters and begin to make more decisions for eternity. Daniel was aware. And he said, I purpose not to allow my body to be defiled. He was determined in his mind to protect his temple. That decision he knew would help him make spiritual decisions because he knew that there was an attempt to confuse religion. They took the idols, they took the, the, the sacred things from the temple and put them with the gods of Babylon because they wanted to confuse your spiritual life. They changed their name. They want to confuse your identity. And if you don't begin to resist in simple things like diet, so you have clear moral perceptions, uh, substance abuse, relationships, if you don't protect your mind, you become a slave forever. Friends, 
If you look around Soweto, you go to Durban right now. If you go up to uh, uh, down in Johannesburg, you begin to see people becoming more like animals because there's a virus that's affecting not the body, but the mind. And an automatic pilot, no apartheid, but people are acting like slaves because the mind is being affected by philosophies, ideas, culture, and values of Nebuchadnezzar, the oppressor, as opposed to the mind of God. When Adam sinned, we all became condemned. We had low self-esteem. We began to become prideful, defensive. Adam attacks his wife. They were once in harmony. The wife blames the snake. She can take no blame. And God is looking and says, I have a mess. The condemned mind is causing corruption in the characters of God's people. And nations upon nations are trying to fix this mind by worshiping the wrong systems that Lucifer has put into place. So Nebuchadnezzar, trying to save his mind and his culture, worships the wrong people. He also oppresses Daniel, trying to get his mind messed up. But Daniel knew, if I can keep my mind correct, I can keep my temple correct, and God can indwell in me, and I can persist. If you want your people to survive, if you want to make a reverse of the curse in South Africa, in Bermuda, in America, don't start with just the body. You need to do something to protect your mind. Well, let's see what God proposes for corrupt minds to be protected. Let's see what happened in history. The text says, the king now has a dream. One night, Nebuchadnezzar goes to bed, and Daniel is sitting there in prison, maybe doing his prayer, and a knock comes on the door. The king has had a terrible dream. This dream that the king has is not a dream for the king. It's a dream for you and me. I want to let you know, friends, God began to communicate even through this king's mind. A few minutes ago, you studied about dreams. He said dreams about somebody that was flying, and dreams about him being naked, and all these dreams. But this was not one of those dreams. This was not a dream that talked about subconscious communication. This was God speaking directly to the king himself. And the God of the universe said to that king, I'm going to give you a vision, not about your life, but about the lives of people to come. And the passage says, Daniel interprets the dream. He says, that was the dream. He told him, now we will tell the king what the dream means. Your majesty, you are the greatest of kings. The God of heaven has given you a sovereignty, power, and strength. I want you to know every empire that exists, God allows them to exist. Now, they work through Satan's power, but God allows them to exist. Nebuchadnezzar, now in charge and a powerful king, wakes up with a dream. There he saw a man. It had a head of gold, a body of silver, a waist of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. Daniel was called out because nobody could interpret the dream. I want you to know today, you may be an oppressed person, you may be down at the bottom, but when God is in your life, even the king comes knocking at your prison door. And the text goes on, says, he made you the ruler over all the inhabited worlds and has put even the wild animals and birds under your control. You are the head of gold, but after you kingdom comes another to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours, inferior. Inferior in what way? They were morally inferior. Each kingdom has more of a condemned mind, and the more condemned our minds are, the more sin we do, the more inferior we become spiritually. Nebuchadnezzar being talked to by God. God wanted to restore and save Nebuchadnezzar. But after Nebuchadnezzar, more inferior kingdom will come. And friends, the text goes, but after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours will rise to take your place. And after that kingdom yet fallen, a third kingdom represented by bronze will rise to rule the world. Well, friends, following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one. Yes, from Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom ahead of gold was Babylon. Then there was another kingdom of, of silver, Medes and Persia. Look in your history books, you'll see there was another kingdom that came. It was a 
represented here in bronze. That represents Greece. And then another kingdom, a fourth kingdom, which was iron. Each metal becoming more inferior. I want you to know mankind is slipping into a moral descent. The spirit of the Lord is being withdrawn and we are becoming more corrupted. And the nations that are in power have less, more, less spirituality. And they do the two things. They want to take pagan religion and mix it with truth. They want to oppress people and control your mind. The passage goes on, while well, some parts of it will be strong as iron, after that iron kingdom, another part will be as weak as clay. This mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other throughout intermarriage, but they will not hold together just as iron and clay do not mix. But well, friends, that represents the last kingdom on earth. After that kingdom, there will be none. We know Babylon is gone. We know Medes of Persia is gone. We know that Greece is gone. We know that Rome is finished. And all climbing up the sides of Rome were Germanic tribes of Western Europe. And those tribes, those countries conquered the known world. They sailed ship to Latin America. And now they speak Spanish there. They sailed ships to the west coast of the lower part of Africa. And they speak Portuguese there. They sailed ships over there to India. And they speak English there. They sailed ships up to Middle Africa. And they speak French there. They sailed ships down to South Africa. And you speak Dutch there. They sailed ships over to uh, my country. And they speak English European nations are these 10 kings that show up around the world right before Jesus comes. And that is the last symbol of Nebuchadnezzar, the last secular empire, and they control the world. But with them comes a religion, just like Nebuchadnezzar had a religion, mixing Christianity, true spirituality with paganism. This religion comes also with a religion, mixing true spirituality with paganism, and ultimately they want to control the condemned mind. During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. During the reigns of these kingdoms today, these Western European nations, France, Switzerland, England, Germany, Spain, Portugal, these are the kingdoms that are talked about here. During the reign of these kingdoms, God will set up another kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. Friends, I want to leave the note today. Shaka Zulu is gone, but there's a bigger kingdom than Shaka. I want you to know Mansa Musa is gone. There's a bigger kingdom than his. All the great kingdoms of Mali and those empires that we know all throughout Africa, they're gone. But there's another kingdom that's coming, and that's the kingdom of the living God. It will crush all these kingdoms, those seven kingdoms, that, those ten kingdoms we talked about, and leaving nothing is, and it will stand forever. That is the very meaning of the rock cut from the mountain through no man's hands that crushed the pieces, the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold, iron, Rome, bronze, Greece, clay, Europe, Silver means of Persia and gold Babylon. All the human nations, friends, will be wiped away soon and very soon by the kingdom of the living God. And it's not a kingdom made by the Zulus. It's not a kingdom made by people from uh, Botswana. It's not a kingdom made by the Germans or the Spanish or the Chinese. No matter, even if they look like a rising empire, they will not be the kingdom that comes next. The next kingdom that wipes out these Western European kingdoms and all other earthly kingdoms is the kingdom of the living God. Somebody ought to say amen. The passage goes on further. I, Daniel, was troubled by, by all I had seen. Daniel had another dream. You thought the dream in Daniel chapter 2 was a big dream. He wakes up years later with another dream. God has repetition and enlargement. That dream that he saw the successive kingdoms will be followed up by another dream. Join me in Daniel chapter 7. And he says, I am my visions terrified me. So I approached one of those standing beside the throne and asked him what it all meant. He explained it to me like this. Daniel's dream shows four animals. One that showed up was looking like a lion. Another one showed up looking like a bear. 
Another one showed up looking like a leopard. And then there was a strange beast that could not be figured out. That bear represents, that, that lion represents Babylon. We saw a head of gold that represented Babylon. We saw a bear that looked like Medes of Persia. We saw a, 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 a bust of the body that was silver looking like Medes of Persia in Daniel chapter 2. Another one that looked like a leopard. We saw a waistband that was made out of bronze that represented none other than Greece. And then there was another one that shows up, a strange beast that could not be figured. We saw legs looking like iron that represented Rome. Daniel has another dream in Daniel 7 that's a repetition of the dream in Daniel chapter 2. But remember, we're dealing with the mind. Each of these kingdoms are trying to coerce and corrupt and control the mind by mixing religion, their religion with truth, oppressing people's bodies and their cultures, and then changing your identity and who you will worship. You look at your culture today, the evidence is clear that the people, despite what we see in Hector Peterson Museum, what we know about in Soweto, all that we've seen that's taking place all up on the Eastern Cape, they're not your people. Something is happening to the minds. Studying African literature is great information, but will it be an inspiration to restore you back into the moral image of God? Uh, studying all about your personal history, your individual history, your tribal history, good information, but will it be transformation back into the original mind before Adam fell? We have a problem. When Adam fell, our minds were condemned and corrupted, and nations rise against nations, and civilizations are wiped out. Not because of military might, because the mind has been managed. I've got good news for you today, my friends. God knew this was coming. He gave Daniel a vision to help you protect your mind in the last days. Come on, friends. These were four huge beasts representing four kingdoms that will arise from the earth. But in the end, the holy people, come on somebody, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom and they will rule forever. Those people whose mind is purpose not to be defiled will rule forever. Not everybody will make it. Some of your family will be destroyed. Some of your culture will be wiped out. Some of your civilization will be eliminated. Friends, this is an urgent message. It's an urgent time. The devil is still mixing religions, oppressing people, and trying to change you to worship him through oppressive systems. But God has established a way out. God is giving you a mind regulator and a heart cleanser. God is giving you a vehicle to transport yourself from one kingdom to another so that you can be among the holy people, red, yellow, black, and white, all are precious in his sight. God has a kingdom that is not based upon tribe, ethnicity, college, or kingdom, but it's based upon the blood of the lamb. And you can be a part of that holy group that resists and persists despite oppressive powers. I, Daniel, and it says, and as I watch, I was troubled. I, Daniel, was troubled by all that I had seen, and my vision terrified me. So I, I approached one of those that was standing beside the throne and asked him what it all meant. He explained it to me like this. These four huge beasts represent four kingdoms that will arise from the earth. But in the end, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom, and they will rule forever. Then it says here in the next verse, then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast. Friends, I want you to know out of all the beasts, the bear, the lion, the leopard, there was a fourth beast that was worse than all the others. He said, forget the lion, which represented Babylon. That was Daniel's kingdom. Don't worry about the bear that represented Medes of Persia. That came shortly after Daniel's kingdom. Don't worry about the leopard. I want to know about that fourth beast. And friends, you want to know about that beast too. He says, that one that was so different from the others and so terrifying, it had devoured and crushed its victims with its iron teeth, bronze claws, trampling their remains beneath their feet. I also asked about the ten horns on the fourth piece. A moment ago, we talked about ten toes in Daniel chapter 2, but he wants to know about ten horns. Those ten toes represented Western European nations. Now he's talking about ten horns. Friends, those ten toes 
10 horns represent the last kingdom before Jesus comes. Whether you like it or not, we are under those 10 toes and 10 horns right now. The passage says that the head and the fourth beast's head and the little horn that came up afterwards and destroyed three of the other horns. But well, we know that during the time of European history, three kingdoms, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, and Horelis, were plucked up and replaced by the papacy. And for 1260 years, papacy ruled all of Europe. Well, you think whenever you go, you see European nations, but where there's colonialism, there's also Catholicism. There's always a papal power working with political powers. They showed up in Latin America with the merchant man, the banker, they showed up with the politician and the military man, and they always showed up with the priest. These three conquered the world. Gold, of course, we need the money. Religion, we need the mind. And the priests, we need to take the land and the property. I mean, the politics to take the land and the property. And this is just Western civilization. Nebuchadnezzar did it to Daniel. He took Daniel out and took the religious systems. So don't get so wrapped up in a fleshly battle because you will utterly lose. Get wrapped up in the spiritual battle because while you may get back the government, but you don't have personal governance because they've infected you with a corona that corrupts your conscience and your mind, and you will not be liberated even though you have the keys to the kingdom. It's a spiritual battle, not a political military battle. And we look at our young boys, they're doing the things that are unseemly and disgraceful. Our young girls are wasting themselves in the hands of strangers. We're focusing on the mind in the last days. And God has given us a way out. We're going to see this right now. It says, I asked about the 10 horns of the fourth beast's head and the little horn that came up after us. We know that little horn was the papal church. And it says, this horn had seemed greater than the others. And it had human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. Well, it's no history. Secular historians would tell you that the Catholic Church controlled the world. It boasts and said, I am vicar of idea. I am in the place of God. That's facts. Don't get apologetic. Get, uh, get aware. And in that telling that story, it wasn't just a Saturday versus a Sunday, Catholicism versus another Christianity. No, it was corrupting the mind. Why? Because it told you that in order to get to God, you've got to go through him. Yeah, remember, the real problem is Adam's condemned mind came to you and came to me. All of us are trying to find religions to escape Adam's condemned mind. And if you follow the wrong religion, instead of worshiping the true God created in his image, you worship the false God and you'll be created in his condemned image. It's about your mind. The reason why our young people and young women and young men are more depraved is because they haven't removed the condemnation. Worshiping the wrong system, you become like the oppressive people you pick up their culture and their religion and you become exactly what they want you to be. Slaves on automatic pilot preaching their sermons while they have set you free because they've controlled the mind. We're talking about a beautiful mind in the last days. We are in the last days. We've established in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. We've also showed that the mind is being corrupted by false religions and cultures. But we said Daniel purposed in his mind that he would not defile because he knew that if you get the mind messed up, the temple is defiled and you will become a temple for Satan as opposed to a temple for the Savior. It says here, he will defy the Most High. Yes, that is what happened. And oppress the holy people. That is what happened. The Most High, he will try to change the sacred festivals and laws and they will be placed under his control for times, times, and half a time. Friends, history has shown us that the papal church controlled the world for 1,260 years. And during that time, times, and half a time, people were murdered and slaughtered and killed throughout Latin America, Europe, western parts of Africa, all across Africa. And this was reality. Just like Nebuchadnezzar conquered, just like the Darius the Mede conquered, just like Alexander the Great conquered, just like Roman Caesars conquered. So it was that the papal church under European domination, they conquered. This is history. This is facts. Wake up, get used to it. If you don't like it, get right. If not, you're going to get left behind. The passage goes on further. He says, 
This particular power, which is corrupting the mind, teach you got to worship him and his people to make it into becoming a God, has now pulled back and left us all confused. But God has sent Daniel 4,000 years ago with a message, especially for you and me, in the last days, so that we can free our mind, a beautiful mind, in the last days. It goes on to further says, but then the court will pass judgment and all his power will be taken away. Somebody ought to say amen. The power of that little horn will be taken away. The power of those other people will be taken away. Yes, and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. Here we have it again. God's holy people will rule and reign. You can have a mind that's protected. You will become a ruler and a reigner, not by looking back in your personal history, but looking into the history of Christ and the future that is for Christ's people. It says, mm -hmm. yes, and his kingdom will last forever and all rulers will serve and obey him. I want you to know today, there's a king of kings and there's a Lord of lords and he's looking for you but he's going to try to access you through your mind. Your question is, how do I preserve my mind? How do I cleanse my mind? If the original problem was Adam's condemned mind, and all of us have controlled each other because of a condemned mind, if Noah showed up, if his people's minds were condemned, how do we escape like Noah escaped? Is there an ark of safety for you and for me? Is there a place to put my children? Well, there won't be many, because it's usually the majority are lost, but God has sent a ship to save you and save me. And friends, we can invite as many people to save the mind. This is the path. The text says, then he said, I am here to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath. What you have seen pertains to the very end of time. Daniel has a Third dream, Daniel chapter 8. This time, it's a different type of dream. He gets straight to the spiritual issue. Friends, when we talk about the mind, the Greeks talk about the intellectual reasoning. Well, in the Hebrew text, and the in what Jesus talked about, the mind is really the mind and the heart, the feelings, the, most, the mind is more than just reasoning. It's really your source of identity. It's the way you see yourself. Do you know there are many young people that walk around with no sense of identity? The mind is corrupted. If you look and you see many people who have lost their culture, lost their tribe, lost their family, they've lost their mind. And the more you live under Nebuchadnezzar's power, there is the means power, Alexander Great's power, the Roman Empire's power, European domination, white supremacy's power, the more you don't just lose your tribe, your culture, your identity, you're losing your mind. It says, then he said, I am here to tell you what would happen in the later times of wrath. What you have seen pertains to the very end of time. Good mind and times. The two-horned ram represents the kings of Medes of Persia. The shaggy male group represents the kings of Greece, and the large horn between the eyes represents the first king of the Greek empire, Alexander the Great. The four prominent horns that replace the one on the large horn shows that the Greek empires will break into four kingdoms, Seleucid, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Cassander. Yes, but none as great as the first. It goes on further to say, and at the end of their rule, that's Greek kings rules, and that happened, check your history book, when their sin is at the height, a fierce king, a master of intrigue, will rise of power, deceit, and intrigue. This is not just a Roman Empire, but there's one particular end game in the Roman Empire, not pagan Rome, but papal Rome. Yes, he will cause a shocking amount of destruction and succeed in everything he does. If you go throughout Latin America, millions of people were slaughtered under papal rule, the great Spanish Inquisition. And if you didn't take on their religion, they slaughtered you. They say over 90% of those people were killed by infection, war, or uh, religious uh, warfare that killed them. 
It goes on further. He will destroy powerful leaders and devastate the holy people. He will be a master of deception and will become arrogant. He will destroy many without warning. He will even take on the prince of princes in the battle, but he will be broken through not by human power. What he's going after is your mind. If you will worship him and bow down to him like they wanted the three Hebrew boys to do in Daniel chapter three, then he will let you go. But if you resist, if you purpose in your mind not to defile your temple, he's came after you. Friends, but behind this beast is the dragon himself. Because there's a war really between Jesus and Lucifer. Your body is the temple. The question is, who will take over your temple? Will you allow Jesus to control it or the devil? Through corrupt pagan religious systems, he combines good religion, true Christianity, with false religion, that's pagan system. And through that system, they lead you to be condemned and controlled. Friends, there's a war for your mind in the last days. The question is, are you winning? This vision about the 2,300 evenings and mornings is true, but none of these things will happen for a long time, so keep this vision secret. That's Daniel's story back then. I want you to know most of that vision is completed. We now stand at the end of time, and there's a message that you need to hear. Take a deep breath. Next. Friends, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. Fact drop. We just talked about kingdoms that are corrupt and crushing. But all of those human kingdoms have a sin nature. And what we do, we become tribal by nature. It's not just Babylon conquered the world. It's not just Medes of Persia conquered the world. It's not just Rome conquered the world. It's not just white supremacy European nations conquered the world. But even within Latin America, there are the Incas and the Mayans conquering each other. Even over there in Europe, there's in the European nations, they, they war against each other. In India, you have the people in India against the people in the nearby countries conquering each other. In mainland Africa, you have tribes. Human beings have group adhesion and the ego becomes central and each wants to dominate each other. Just at different times in Earth's history, one group controls the whole planet. But all of us have this disease of condemnation and pride. And if we don't solve that as an individual, you will never enter into the kingdom of God so that you can rule forever. So the root problem is a human problem that came from Adam. When Adam sinned, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. You have it. I have it. We have it. Controlling other people, dominating other people, white supremacy, tribal warfare, male against female, is rooted in a condemned mind, trying to dominate somebody else to make yourself a supremacist. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God, a new life for everyone. The only way to fix the root problem in your life, to save the little boys in Soweto, to save the little girls down in Durban, to reverse the curse, they need to restore their mind. And that mind is restored because of a righteous relationship with Christ. Let's go on further. Because one person's disobedience, Adam, God, many became sinners. Not only did we become damned, but we became addicted to sin. There's some things you can't stop. There's some people who can't break the addiction to pornography. There's another person who can't break the addiction to lust. There's another person who can't break the addiction to pride. There's another person who can't break the addiction to gossiping. There's another person who can't break the addiction to white supremacy. There's another person who can't break the addiction to male domination. There's another person who can't break the addiction to I'm better than you. Talk my, this is our condition. Not only are we condemned, we are also control with an addictive nature. We are sick. But the sex, but because of another man's person obeyed, that's Jesus. Many will be made righteous. Just like you're addicted to sin, it's possible to become addicted to righteousness. Oh, you didn't hear me. Just like you are automatic pilot, you just reproduce sin, it's possible to actually be an automatic pilot and reproduce righteousness. And it's not because of what you did, but because of what somebody else did. Just like Adam made you sick, somebody else has made you safe. Yeah, if you can trust 
God to do what he said he did. He can fix you where you're broken. He can heal you where you're hurting. He can restore you where you're wounded. Jesus can fix your mind. If condemnation has you under the control of Nebuchadnezzar, the Greeks, the Romans, or the Europeans, I want you to know that Christ can break you free and put you under control of the Holy Spirit. If you've given your body away, Jesus can take it back. If you've given your mind away, Jesus can bring it back. If you've lost your culture, he can give you a new culture at the cross. Jesus Christ is a mind regulator. He's seeking the Lord and wants to restore anybody that wants to come into his kingdom to resist oppressive powers by Lucifer. Fact says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified. Friends, not only did Jesus forgive you, but he also took your addictive nature and crucified it. Yeah, he fixed you right up. He cleaned your mind, but he also saved your body. It says, he says, we were crucified with Christ. Your addictions were crucified. Your afflictions were crucified. Your habits were crucified so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Friends, you don't have to do the things that corruption, coercion, collusion has done to you. You've made a mistake. You've gone the wrong way. You've messed up. Nebuchadnezzar's crippled you, but Jesus is willing to save you by killing your old man and giving you something new. So also should consider yourselves to be dead. There's nothing else you got to do but to accept what Christ has already done. You have been saved from condemnation. You've been healed from your hurting. Jesus crucified your addiction. He's covered your affliction. You have been made brand new by faith. So start acting like it has already happened. It says, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Why? Because your mind has already been fixed. Your body does not have to be controlled. When you've got your mind crucified, your body now is under new management. That old condemned mind is crucified so the new body has been uh, uh, enlivened and empowered. The text says, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil. The devil wants to control your mind so he can control your body so you can use your temple to worship him. The body is a temple and through the body you worship. What have you been doing with your body? Remember Daniel purposed in his mind not to defile his temple. The way you do that, you need a new mind for the last days. If a new mind, you protect your body. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil serve. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have been made alive. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. You remember your body, like Daniel, has to be purposed to serve God. It says, I love God's law with all my heart. I know that's what you're thinking. I want to do right. I want a purpose in my heart. I've tried this before, but it didn't work. Friends, let me tell you, it says, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. Yeah, yeah. Daniel purposed in his mind. This person says, I purposed in my mind, but there's something that's pulling my body. It's fighting my mind. Daniel seemed to have found the secret here, and I want to give you the secret. It says this here. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. There's some things that you keep doing. You're under oppression. We've had our apartheid. We now got government that is in, in, in turmoil. We've got, we've got corona. We've got nations against nations, tribes against tribes, people against people. Somebody's family has been messed up. Somebody's been physically sick. Somebody may have been raped. Somebody may have been abused. I don't know. You may have everything. Maybe you're confused by the music you're listening to. It's in your mind. Maybe the programs you're watching on internet, it's programming your mind. Maybe the pornography you're watching on television, it's programming your mind. So your mind is messed up. And though you're saying, I'm going to do right, there's something that's pulling you back. <clears throat> it says, this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. You want to do what's right. But you can't stop doing what's wrong. Who 
will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. And I want to let you know, friends, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't control Daniel. And I'm going to tell you, the devil does not have to be able to control you. Daniel saw that throughout time, things will get worse. And it is as worse as it can be right now. But I want you to know, friends, that the power that was available to Daniel is available for you. But you must first purpose in your mind not to defile your temple. Thank God the answer is in Jesus, Christ our Lord. See, so you see how it is. In my mind, really, I want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. So isn't it possible to have your mind with a good purpose, but your body going another direction? How do you fix that? Let me show you. The text says, this is the answer. Remember, Adam's problem was he was condemned. As long as you're condemned, listen, your body will be controlled. Are you miss me? Because of condemnation, we are controlled. What's condemnation? I feel bad. I feel guilty. I feel sinful. So you may make up your mind, but if you haven't removed the condemnation and cleansed the temple and cleansed the sanctuary from guilt, of sex, guilt of lies, guilt of sin, feeling dirty. If that hasn't been cleansed in the mind, your body will be a slave to anybody. The purposing in the mind is I will not defile it. So Daniel knew if I eat the wrong foods, if I watch the wrong programs, if I listen to the wrong music, if I take on the wrong ideas, my mind will no longer remain pure and I'll feel condemned. So he's very careful of the things that can affect his clarity. Watch what he says. I know there's no condemnation for those who are belonging to Christ. The first thing you want to do to fix your body is remove condemnation from your mind. How? Because condemnation put Adam under the tree and made him addicted Condemnation has you under the tree and addicted. The key is to remove the condemnation. What? Because you belong to Jesus, you got to know you have a new tribe. You have a new kingdom. You have a new identity. You are a new person. How did it happen? At the cross, he snatched you, put him inside of you. He crucified you and brought you up. And it has already happened. You belong to a new tribe. And the king of kings, the Lord of lords is Jesus, and you have no condemnation. I don't care what you've done, where you've been, who you've been with, or how many times you've done it. You may come from a small tribe or a big tribe, a small country or big country. You may be red, yellow, black, or white. There's a tribe of Judah whose blood runs through everyone who by faith accepts they are not condemned. You have been cleansed. The text says, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. My friends, the only way out is to cleanse your mind. How? By accepting the grace of God. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. The text says, you must have the same attitude that Christ has. You really want to be free? You've got to change your attitude about yourself. You must first be aware that you belong to God. Jesus did that. You must also be aware that God already has claimed you and is cleansing you. The Holy Spirit is doing that. But you also got to choose, like Daniel, not to allow your mind to corrupt with false religion. The pagan systems teach you got to do something to be saved. Jesus teach he did something to save you. You don't have to change any bricks into bread to prove you're the child of God. You just got to stand on the word of God. You are his child. He's claimed you as his own. He's paid the price. There's no condemnation because you are already in Christ Jesus. You're in another kingdom and you don't have to move from your chair. You just stand up and declare, I have been born again because I have faith in the blood of Christ. It says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Now, this is the type of mind you got to have. When you're resting in Christ, 
You don't have to strive for what? Supremacy. Nebuchadnezzar, supremacy. Uh, 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 Medes of Persia, supremacy. Greece, supremacy. Rome, supremacy. White supremacy, European domination, supremacy, tribal warfare, supremacy, Hutu Tutsu, supremacy, Zulu Kosa, supremacy, Jamaica Bermuda, supremacy. It's always this ego striving. And I will be like the most high, Lucifer. Jesus said, no, if you want to really be free of condemnation, though he was equal to God, he didn't cling to it. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took on the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. We've got to have a mind like Christ, not one of supremacy, but not I, but Christ who lives in me. We've got to empty ourselves of self. <clears throat> Finally, <clears throat> Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord our God. Friends, if you want to survive and be in the new kingdom, you need a new mind for the last days. And that's the mind that says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but Christ that lives in me. The condemnation has been removed by grace. The control is released by grace. And you get to choose to live a life of grace. The text says, during the reigns of those kings, which kings? German, Portuguese, Spanish, English, Dutch, French, all those kings that are right now running the planet, <clears throat> God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. Our cultures are going to be conquered if we don't enter into the kingdom of Christ. There is no more nationalism that's going to fix this. God needs people who've got a new mind. It will crush all those kingdoms into nothingness. This kingdom of Christ will crush the other kingdoms and it will stand forever. You can be in a kingdom that stands forever. This is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands that crush the pieces of statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true and it is meaning is certain. Friends, we are at the end of time and the beginning of a new kingdom. And the kingdom starts with your mind. What must I do? This is what you have to do. Remember Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified. Your ego, yourself. And you've also been covered. Christ has covered you by the blood. When Jesus went to the cross, I want you to know he paid for everything that Adam did and he fixed everything broken inside of you. You are in a new kingdom because you've got a new mind, but you've got a purpose not to defile your temple. How? By remembering that you have been saved. By trusting him, stop trying to be saved. By accepting what he's already done and stop trying to do it again. You, by faith, have received the grace of God. Trust him and obey him, for the kingdom of God is at hand and it's starting right now in your new mind. God bless you, Kunjani. Thank you very much. Happy Sabbath. Amen, Elder James. Thank you for such a powerful message. You just filled our mind with Christ. I like this verse from Philippians 2, verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Uh, we are very grateful for the sermon, and we've been fortified during our, our, our seminar this week to protect the mind. 
and and we are empowered uh, going forward we will work for the lord and the work the lord will work through us we thank you uh, elder james pass our warm regards to your family and to our sister church in bermuda uh, church can we bow our heads with prayer from elder bonganim koza <clears throat> Let us pray. Savanga Jova Glunga, who would have sung on Kulunkulu, way to Tina Singabandonabaco, Sibonga, Amazui, and Kutazo from Dr. James, and from the Sabbath morning, you've blessed us with the powerful words from Brother Kuom as well. Tikuna Mandlage, Ivanati Manje, Pinde, Ube, and Kulunkulu way to Kubek and Uba, and is in Tele Sazo Kubega this afternoon. Amen. Amen, Mdala. Church, can we meet at half past two uh, for our next program? It will be facilitated by Sister Dina Lady. Thank you. Have a blessed lunch. Church, we will meet at half past two, our next program. Thank you.